Thank you so much for joining us um, for this Indaba session, Political Ecology in North, South, and Beyond. I'm not really supposed to be here, um, be but because last year I was appointed uh, associate editor of the Journal of Political Ecology, lo and behold, I was allowed to be here. So if any of you are considering publishing in our community journal, uh, at some point, uh, grab a hold of me during the conference and get to know a little bit about uh, the journal. Um, so the journal has existed almost 30 years, and it's very much this um, labor of love and care and conviviality, very much an ethics of trying to support uh, scholars, especially from less privileged institutions in, in publishing internationally. It has a nice commonality with the network here. It's for free, completely for free. It's also just like Pollen run for academics and by academics. So the journal, like the, our community, is really what we make of it. So, uh, so with that, uh, an invitation to come and chat with me about that and, and to contribute. Thanks a lot. And uh, now I'll give the word to Danford, who will lead us through the session. Thank you so much. Uh, we did break the tradition here. As you can see, our speakers are not uh, sitting and the franchise, uh, we're trying to break that hierarchy. So uh, you can actually see our activism in action here. So my name is Danford, and here I'm at home. Uh, I'm a researcher here at the University of Wazul Natal at the Center for Civil Society. So I'll be facilitating this uh, in Daaba. Uh, where we are going to interrogate uh, the political ecology, the north, south, and beyond. We are going to challenge uh, these binaries as we have realized that our problems are similar. Those that uh, experienced uh, the, the floods uh, yesterday, um, those that are uh, coming from Canada, you've experienced uh, the fires. So we are having uh, similar, similar problems across the globe. So this uh, false dichotomy, we are here to break it today, like we just did now. Okay, some house rules. Uh, please uh, switch, put your, your cell phone on silent, and um, uh, we are going to call the speakers to come and uh, share with us their offerings. Some are joining us uh, through uh, the virtual scape. Some will come and present their slides here. And then after that, we'll have a, sort of an organic engagement with the audience. This is an Indaba. No one is a professor, no one is an activist. We are just all equal. So we just uh, bounce our ideas from each other. So if you've got something to say, please feel free to say it. Get it out of the chest. And if you've got some uh, theoretical uh, explanations that you need to challenge, uh, please uh, do so. It's an Indaba. Everyone is equal. Uh, let's just have fun. So I will call the first speaker to the Indaba, one of the protesters who refused to sit in the chair to come and uh, give us a talk. I will call uh, Professor Mano to come and uh, continue with the protest here at the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know the chair just said we're not going to have professors and so forth, and he calls me professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, for so, in some ways, we have got an inherent. <laughs> okay, um, that has to do with the language. So, so, um, um, colleagues, I thought we we. I will just say some thoughts with 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 you on. On, on, on what the, the South-North um, 
collaborations divide um, inequalities um, have troubles, troubled us for some time and, and some of the ways of engaging with that. Um, we have enough material from this conference so far to indicate to us that we, we can begin to work on both sides of the oceans to, to try and, and engage with the issues that we all are concerned about. So I, I just thought I will, I will follow the fashion and, and use decoloniality as a lens to deal with, um, with, with these, these kind of regional inequalities. Um, and, and, but I, I'm not going into decoloniality because it, it is the, you know, something that's very uh, favorable at the moment. Um, there's so many decolonialists around and everybody thinks they are, um, which, which is fine. But uh, what will that mean for, for political ecology, especially in our in unequal world? Um, where we need to be mindful of this. So, you know, the books on the screen will be familiar to most of the people who are engaged in this debate, even uh, before decoloniality became a fashionable concept. Um, there, there are people who have been engaging with this. Um, there's a few who have been following post-colonial studies would know that some, some of these engagements uh, with uh, knowledge production, um, with the geopolitics of knowledge, um, has, has been there. But of course now it's taken up through, through a new phrase. Um, I've, I've been looking at, at the literature um, to, to get a sense of what is it that we're trying to do. But I was struck by how almost everybody it's, it's sort of going in the same directions. Um, I mean, the literature becomes, it's becoming more repetitive quite. Uh, every time you read the introduction, you say, well, you know, I've, I've had this already. Um, and and it's, it's almost like uh, there's a chat GBT writing up these things and everybody just copying and pasting. But um, what, what do we see in the, decolo in the decolonial literature? Um, and and this, this, this is what is happening across many fields um, where people are engaged with this. It, it's almost like everybody feels that they should decolonize their own field or their own subfield, um, and, and they're all drawing from the same area. And, and, and here are some of the key things that comes out of that decoloniality, which is, you know, the need to theorize, to re-theorize. Um, and it, it appears to be very simple, you know, let's all re-theorize, but you know, what is the approach to do that? And what is wrong with the theories that we're using? Um, and, and a very, perhaps, ambitious um, uh, project is to, to remake the world. You know, we all need to, to live in a better world but we have different ideas of what that world should look like. Um, even, in, even in mapping, I, I know that the, there's a, a theory of the boundless world uh, where we wouldn't have immigrants because there are no states. Okay. But you know, this, this, this is the way people are thinking about remaking the world um, and reconfiguring knowledge production and advancing knowledge from alterity. So um, drawing knowledge from, um, from the margins, as to speak. And, and so we, we have seen in other, in other disciplines how they've tried to do this. Um, and, and what perhaps is more interesting is, is, is how the literature suggests we need to unmask continuities of unequal relations in society and to make visible and address ontological and epistemological violence of scholarship. And I think this is interesting for political ecology. What is, you know, what is our epistemological, epistemological violence um, within, within political ecology? 
um, given the, the inequalities in the regions of the world. But what I'm also interested in is how people think we should approach this. Okay, the, the literature on what needs to be done, I mean, the list is, is almost like a shopping list. But um, what are the approaches that people suggest, um, that scholars have suggested we should do? Um, you know, theorizing marginalized knowledges. Um, I, I find this very interesting as an approach. And it took me back to what has been happening in this country um, during the struggles where we thought about education and, and there was a move to people's education. Um, there are colleagues here who, who have been part of that generation of wanting people's education um, or pursuing people's education, which, which, which will tie into some of the decolonial suggestions or approaches that are being made of, of how, what, what education should actually mean, how we should approach, how we should ask questions, how we should engage um, in research. Um, most of us will be familiar with um, the pedagogy of the oppressed, which is more in educational uh, time. But, but it's all about knowledge. And, and sometimes we take this as referring to teaching and curriculum reform and so forth. But they're all about knowledge production. While we're trying to decolonize um, uh, disciplines, knowledge, and so forth, they, they, there's something that is very clear that in the, in the process of doing so, we're caught in the politics of citations. And I, th I think that's hypocrisy. <laughs> okay. You know, people are interested in saying what, you know, what the villagers have said there, what somebody well, um, in the township has said there, but not what the scholar who lives there has said. And, and I just find this interesting that in the, in, the, in, the, you know, in the interest of trying to bring in the knowledges um, to the fore, we are at the same time marginalizing the, the scholarship, the, the local scholarship in those areas. Um, and, and I just find this very, um, very troubling, I must say. Um, and not that, you know, um, not that people shouldn't, um, shouldn't uh, cite whoever they've read, um, but, but it is important to know that we are also perpetuating sometimes the very same thing that we want to change, because it's good for us. You know, it's good for my next promotion, it's good for my H index, which for some people is the second name. Um, so, so it is important that if, if indeed we're true to ourselves about acknowledging knowledge beyond the academy and, and trying to learn as much as we can from Southern theory. I mean, we should do that genuinely. And, and I would hope that, um, you know, the few papers that are beginning to come out in, in political ecology, Journal of Political Ecology, to, to, to engage with this um, are, are, in, are an encouraging sign. Um, but, but for me, it's more about doing that decolonial political ecology rather than talking about it, because we can all talk about it, actually. Um, now, I've, 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 I've come across uh, some very interesting ap approaches which, which summarizes what we need to do. Um, and this is captured in um, Mambras um, and colleagues' work on, on decolonization. Um, in short, as a way of thinking about the world um, and, and, and how these two reference, thinking about the world and, and, and doing something about it through alternatives. Uh, would be quite useful. And, and I, in, on reflection, I thought political ecology um, has been very critical uh, from its foundation about, about um, society-nature relations, society-environment relations. Um, we've been critical about that. And, but perhaps the challenge we have is, is to think more about alternative forms and political processes. So when we were encouraged not to use the chairs, I said, well, this is an alternative praxis. Um, but, but we should be mindful that decolonization itself has its own critiques. So, so, so these are beginning to emerge. So, so doing coloni decolonization, it's, 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 it's not all that good. Uh, in the, <laughs> we, you know, we all think, you know, 
by trying to engage with decolonization, especially reinsetting the South, bringing in um, um, marginalized groups and so forth, what we might be doing unintentionally and sometimes intentionally is that we, we keep that domination. So if, if one were to do a, a, a search on literature and decolonization, where does it come from in most of the cases? From metropolitan universities. I mean, this is one of the critiques that, that, that is there. Um, and, 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 and there are signs that sometimes it's, 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 more about, it's, it's more of tokenism than actually a serious political project that we think we should engage with. Um, but there, there's another angle to decolonization which is important. And, and, and I'm bringing this here because it then helps us to think of the, the South-North relations um, and, uh, through this lens. You know, Taivo um, wrote her recent book um, which is titled Against Decolonization. Um, and and it, it was an intriguing title because everybody is about decolonization. And here somebody says, well, hang on, we actually, we don't want decolonization. But that's not literally what he's saying in the book. Um, um, but what I found interesting um, in his, in his uh, thinking is that um, while we are thinking about decolonization, we do underestimate, um, and, and he was writing about Africa in this case, African agency. It could be the agency of, of, of many other groups that, that we can think of in tackling um, colonialism and, and its legacy. So people have been engaged with, with colonialism. There, there have been ways of trying to decolonize. Um, we know struggles, political struggles for liberation have been about decolonization. Um, but but um, many of us are disappointed with the results that we, that have come out of those, those struggles, um, including where we are now. Um, but I, I want to share with you some of the experiences and I don't have much time. Um, where, where we, I've been involved in some of the networks, and these are just few. Um, and, and when was the Worldwide Universities Network? Um, where we thought it would be quite useful to create a global Africa group. Um, and and this, this, this network was institutionalized. I mean, many universities working together. Um, sort of middle of the range um, universities um, in terms of um, global standing, if, if we believe in, in those categorizations. You know, they, they came together to bring their scholars. Um, but, but there was nothing about, well, there were two institutions from the continent, um, my university and the University of Ghana. Um, and this was a collaboration with the rest of the world. So you've got, you've got two countries representing the continent and, and the collaboration is, is about and how, how does one go about ensuring um, that there is, there is co-production of knowledge, that there is the geopolitics of knowledge is engaged with? And that, that was a challenge that, that we faced when we actually established this group. Um, I, 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 I chaired the group um, with, with a colleague in, in, in Australia, David Mickler. Um, it, it was not an easy exercise, but we have learned through that project that um, we need to be very strategic in how, okay, three minutes. In three minutes, um, we, we, learned, we learned quite quickly that one needs a strategy. And, and this, 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 this is South Africa, Ghana, trying to engage with a collaborative research with many universities. Um, and some of you come from those universities um, that you know, were part of this network. Um, and and it, it, was, it, it was perhaps for me eye-opening in, in, in how we should go about co-production. So, so we did some project where um, nothing, nothing could be done without, without the scholars on Africa. And, and that was a very, a very difficult exercise because then you you know, in the hierarchy of knowledge production, what tends to happen is that your top scholars want to, you know, to work together so that they remain at the top. 
I want to bring somebody else from the margins and they dilute their status. And, 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 and that for me was a very interesting exercise, which, which we worked very hard. And we used the SDGs on partnerships to say, well, the SDGs that most people embrace and others criticize, we know, so as we should have partnerships, but how do we think about partnerships as, as scholars, as institutions? Um, and and so, so, so what the point I want to make is this, in, engaging co-production of knowledge is not simply a technical exercise. It's not just getting somebody to work with you. There's a lot of thoughts that need to go into that so that we, we actually um, work as, as, as equals in the, in the, in the uh, networks or any grouping. Um, and, and the other group that I've worked with, uh, that I'm still working with, is the International Critical Geography Group, um, which, which is our, is, is own uh, mode of operations in, in terms of uh, trying to ensure that th there's equality. Um, we, we, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen people um, sitting uh, like we're doing here <laughs> to ensure inequalities, but, but, but they've engaged with that question. And inequality is not given because people are already unequal. And, and one has to work out um, what that could be. Um, I, I mean, I don't have much time to go into details about this, but um, in, in most of these cases, I've used my position as a member of the Society of South African Geographers to, you know, to get into these networks. Um, but also my own, my own um, research uh, themes. And, and I just want to touch on the International Geographical Union Commission on Indigenous Knowledge and People's Rights. And this was a very interesting commission for me because then we had all indigenous groups in the, in the US, in Canada, in, um, in Australia, South Africa, you know, Africa, um, Maybe I should say South Africa because I was representing South Africa rather than the rest of Africa. But I realized that actually they just needed somebody from the continent, as, as it happens in most cases. Okay, um, and 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 you know, feminist scholars will also say the same. But you know, just get some woman in here. But what I found very useful in this exercise was, and, and this is on the South-North relationship, is that you begin to use the same material, bring the same concerns and tackle them together. And, and I think this is perhaps a very useful approach to, to working together and to break the, the divisions between the global uh, south and the global north um, and, and how we could collaboratively work together. I mean, we have heard so many stories of the Durban South and, and how they're engaging with, um, with, with you know, the, the oil companies, whose head office uh, headquarters are somewhere there um, overseas. But, you know, we don't have this collaboration of people who are in the headquarters of this working with the group that is being affected by the decision made up in these air-conditioned offices. And, and I think for me, those are the kind of material that we could use to begin to work together. Um, I think I've used my three minutes. I don't want to. I don't want the chair to come and drag me from the floor. But I'll stop there. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mano, for exploring, uh, you know, the power dynamics that are between the global north and the global south and how these power dynamics uh, shape the discourse of public ecology. I'm going to, oh, he's already here. <laughs> I, wanted to bring, I wanted to bring someone uh, who's virtually, but you're already here, it's fine. Um, I will call upon uh, Felipe to give us uh, his presentation. Let me just open it for you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let's start with the beginning here. Well, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers for making this event in person. Uh, so we're able to, to, to join this uh, in Daba. Um, 
has always been a dream to me to come to, to the African continent and especially to South Africa. I think there are, we have so much to learn and to exchange with each other. And I'm coming from a special place in that sense, which is the state of Bahia in Brazil. That is the uh, Africa from the other side, we could say. You know, it's an African descendant city, and this is, has been a wonderful experience to me as a white southern Brazilian to work in Bahia in an anti colonial university, a public university, and trying to take serious decolonization, not as a metaphor, but an everyday job. Uh, my first position in Bahia, I was professor of decolonization of knowledge, environment and society. That was official, uh, the, the name of this public position. And it, it made me to think how I could really put in practice uh, decolonization of knowledge in a, such an equal country in Brazil, but working inside a public and university. And I have been very, very lucky because due to the long time struggle of indigenous and black movements in Brazil for affirmative action. Today we have a diverse university and it has been a wonderful pleasure to work with indigenous black and Quilombo students in Bahia. And I will share a bit of this experience uh, with you. So this is the work of Denilson Baniwa, a wonderful artist uh, that he has been, uh, we have been working together. He, he was the artist that, that, that gave the, the design of the Latin American Congress of Political Ecology. Well, in Latin America Political Ecology, we're organizing different networks. Uh, there is the Latin American Congress of Political Ecology. I organized the third uh, one in Bahia in 2018, and last year happened in Quito, uh, the fourth Congress. Uh, there is the Latin America Research Group of Political Ecology with more than 100 researchers. I, co I was one of the coordinators with Mina Navarro from Mexico, Denise Roca from uh, Peru, uh, working in Colombia, and now the coordinators every three years change. Uh, Lucrecia Wagner from Argentina, Aida Lopes from Mexico, and Melissa Moriano from Ecuador that was the previous organizer. Uh, and we have just published a, a, a book with, a, a, it's always collective work, as you can see, you know, with Bea Bustos, who organized the first Latin American Congress in, in Chile 2014, and other friends, published by Routledge, which is Latin America and the Environment. I would highly uh, recommend you to take a look. These are some of the publications, so we are producing a lot in Latin America, from Latin America, you know, and uh, it's not, we're not Latin Americanists, you know, we are working with environmental struggles and trying to search for new theoretical frameworks and how to, 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 to work with territorial struggles with a great commitment. Uh, during the, the pandemic, we were affected in Brazil by another virus of fascism, and we had to face the pandemic and Bolsonaro. It was a terrible moment, a very depressing one, and, uh, and, and, and during this period, Bolsonaro led a genocide against indigenous people. Uh, I was already working with partnership with friends from the University of Sussex and Manchester, and we all uh, were looking together, Mary Manton from Sussex and Peter Wade from Manchester, and we were lo looking for common ways that we could uh, interact uh, and help uh, indigenous groups and also Quilombo uh, populations to survive the genocide. And uh, we, we managed to, 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 to transfer funds from project and pro uh, different projects during the pandemic to invest on indigenous students and artists. And we did this beautiful job, this beautiful site. It's a not disguise, a collective project that we're researching conflict, but also beautiful things, be the beauty, static art that could mobilize these struggles. We mapped 31 environmental conflicts in the northeast part of Brazil and the Amazon. They are very different forms of conflicts. We have conflicts for mining, land grabbing, but also ecotourism and uh, shrimp farm, even production of cachaça, the delicious drink that was drying out a sacred lake from a, a, a Tapeba nation. We were able to finance 20 artists to create artwork from these territories, thanks to the queen that to subvert her, <laughs> her funds uh, for a much better uh, use than only doing finance research and to go to the territories, but finance the territories to think through art. 
and we trained more than 15 indigenous black and Colombolas students during this process. Uh, out of that, that uh, uh, experience, there is also this anti-racist indigenous art that you can uh, visit here in the, in the second floor. Some of those artists, we invited them to research in the university as visiting researchers and we paid them fellowships also with funds from AHRC and other international agencies. I'm telling you that because it's, it's inspiring to see that we can work together. We can really build uh, work, to, international work together and recognizing our privilege and our positionality in different places that we are, either Europeans or white Brazilians that we all share in somehow some privilege that, and and we can find ways to work together uh, to, to, to denounce racism and to denounce coloniality and other forms of oppressions. Uh, this is uh, another uh, work that you can uh, visit this experience of this wonderful exhibition. This is the new Sombaniwa in his anti-racist uh, work. He's denouncing the violence of uh, agribusiness in Brazil. Uh, from this experience and reading in, of Latin American literature, I would briefly share with you four ideas that I think they are uh, wonderful theoretical contributions that comes from, from the territories. The idea of plurinational states, the colonizing the state. This is in Bolivia, this is in Ecuador, this is, was in the wonderful Chilean constitution that was defeated by fascists in Chile and my solidarity to the indigenous uh, population, to, to Chilean populations. But it's also in the Brazilian constitution when they recognize uh, that, 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 that indigenous people in Brazil, they have the right for territory and they have the, life, the right to live as they want and the Brazilian state should respect uh, and, 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 and live in diversity. Tecoporã, uh, sumac, tecoporã is the word in Guarani, sumac calçai, sumac camana. This uh, well living, these are deep philosophy of life and of existence. These are not only expressions in the law. This should be taken serious to, to deal with the ecological, uh, not the ecological emergency, only that, but the civilizational crisis that we are living. Rights of nature, we are nature, you know, and anti extractivism or sustainable extractivism, I would call that agroecology, that comes from the Robert Tappers and indigenous struggles in the Amazon. Those are alternatives that are being put in place. So the plurinational states are, uh, as I was telling you, it is the, the decolonized state, but also become wild, as Gerard Guarani, a wonderful woman uh, from the Guarani nation, who is calling us, uh, inviting us to, 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 to turn ourselves from the urban perspective to a more uh, other perspective to live with Earth reconquest, land back, retake, demarcation of lands, but also of imaginaries of ending up the idea of a modern Brazil, set modern, uh, settled modernity. This is Olinda Yawar and Ziel uh, inside the Secretary Museum in a performance last year. Yanderecote, Coporã, those are ontological perspectives from indigenous philosophies. Uh, they, they offer us new ways to, to organize our lives, beyond, let's say, energy transition to social, ecological, more deep transformations. And uh, as I was saying, no, overcoming the civilizational crisis that produced the ecological catastrophe. These are deep philosophical contributions that must be taken serious. Let's leave Plato and Aristotle on the side for a while. This is Olinda transforming herself as a tree. Another wonderful performance for this is extraordinary artist. She is hunting the uh, King George here in the second floor. I would recommend you to go we'll see that. And uh, she sends a message from a tree during this performance that we are part of this project. Rise of nature is overcoming the colon uh, uh, colonial dichotomies. River, mountains, ancestrality, earth is the future. Ayuton Krenak says, another indigenous philosoph philosophy. The enchanted and territorial struggles. A great example is the return of the mantle uh, to Pinamba Cloak that you can see some pictures over here. Uh, that's a project from Celia to Pinamba, this beautiful, wonderful artist from my state of Bahia. And a great news that just came out yesterday 
uh, from the press. It's not that the mantle that were not being produced for years, they return spiritually and physically to the Tupinamba nation once they have reconquered the territory. But the mantle that has been stole by European colonizers and was placed in the National Museum in Denmark, it's going back to Brazil uh, after the struggle of Celia. The, the, uh, the National Museum in, in, in Denmark in Copenhagen, yesterday he announced that he's sending back to Brazil to contribute to the Brazilian National Museum. Thanks, Celia, that have promoted this debate. This is Babau, the chief, wearing the mantle. And Celia is now working with the decolonization of, of the sky and um, uh, helping us to look up the skies and we see this is a, a constellation of a Tupinamba chief that's in the entrance of the main library of my university. Thank you, Sally, for making the, the, our university more beautiful. Anti-extractivism, sustainable extractivism, our agroecology, there are alliances that are being built and we, sh we can find ways to work together. In Brazil, there are today net of people, Teia dos Povos, forest people alliances from the 80s that is still moving movements from Chico Mendes, Ailton Cranach, rubber tapas and indigenous people against rubber barons, against miners, against land grabbers, against deforestation, to, 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 to finding unity in diversity. The, the, these are uh, experiences that we can learn and, 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 and work together in academia. This means decolonizing forests, dismantling the Anthropocene, other narratives of the Anthropocene. They are, what the, those environmental defenders are doing is that they are dismantling the Anthropocene on the ground. This is the example from the dear uh, Katja Tonkira. Uh, uh, she's the chief of the Gavion Nation in, in Pará, heavily affected by valley and dam minings. Look her uh, indigenous land, absolutely surrounded by deforestation. And she has been the past three years, after she reconquers a bit of her land, replanting the beautiful nut trees. She wants to plant. She says that that was an indigenous village, it became a farm, and now it's going to be back an indigenous village with the forest. Same struggle as Bejai, uh, also a partner in some of the research. Bejai, he's planting copra. Copra is the traditional Kayapo uh, farm, which is uh, part farm, part forest. But the production of food is the production of forest as well. And uh, this is... Uh, Bejai working. We've been working together with Bejai and, uh, and, and Katya, writing their memories, writing their ideas with other indigenous leaders and trying to, 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 to think with them and from their theoretical perspectives. To end, this is a message from uh, the dear Denilson Banil, our inspiring artist, Floresta de Pé, Down Fascism. And uh, I love this, this work from the Nilsson that he tries to get the jaguar, which in Portuguese, jaguar, I don't know if you know, but it's a Tupinamba name. It's not English, it's Tupi, Yawarete, that comes from Brazil. But in Brazil, you don't say that word. We say onça, that comes from Greek. So the Nilsson, he tries to bring back the jaguar uh, to, to, to the Brazilian cities. And the Nilsson, to, 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 to create this, uh, the symbol of a floresta against fascism, he was inspired by the alliances of Zapatistas and Black Panthers in the US, Zapantera. So he brings Zapantera and the Jaguar to find unity in the struggles with Earth. Thank you all for this opportunity. Here. Thank you, Felipe, for giving us uh, an interesting uh, uh, presentation. I, I really like the pictures. Uh, now I'm going to cross over virtually. I will invite uh, Tracy to come and uh, give us uh, her contributions. May you kindly do it uh, in, in 10 minutes, please? Tracy? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and sorry I'm not I'm not there in person, um, but uh, definitely really excited to share with you some of the the work that I've been doing around public political ecology. So I do have some slides, and I just want to make sure that um, those are are visible to the audience. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm going to be speaking today about public public ecology as a network and practice toward equitable earth stewardship. So there's a, a growing number of innovative projects in the area of public or engaged political ecology conducted through various networks such as Entitled. But I want to share my understanding of the subfield and how I've been studying and practicing it over the last decade. Some of this work has been published as an open access article in the Journal of Political Ecology, which sets the stage for public political ecology as an approach for practicing engaged scholarship in this moment of ecological disruption that places justice front and center. So, um, so a, a political, um, ethical, and educational project drawing on the work of Antonio Gramsci, public political ecology operates through what I call a community of praxis, or theoretically informed practice. So for Gramsci, praxis is the reciprocal relationship between thought and action, where ideas become a material force. As such, public political ecology is a theoretically informed practice of a diverse set of actors, which includes an important role for intellectuals, who share environmental concerns, collaborate, and co-produce knowledge in order to guide effective action for social justice and earth stewardship. So public political ecology guides many aspects of my research, teaching, mentorship, and engagement. So I don't know if you're if you're able to like call the slides, but um, this would be the, the third one. But a few years ago, while as a faculty member at the University of Arizona in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment, I launched the Public Political Ecology Lab as a space to advise and mentor graduate students interested in engaged scholarship from a political ecology perspective. And I've used the lab as a platform for scholars of political ecology to share their perspectives on scholar activism and engaged scholarship through blogs, through videos, and digital stories. And with, the, with members of the Public Political Ecology Lab, we've developed the Climate Alliance Mapping Project, which is an initiative which partnered with indigenous communities and environmental organizations to develop maps and digital stories of climate justice. More specifically, it builds interactive climate justice story maps that bring together scientific data and digital stories produced by effective, communi effective communities to educate the public connect local communities with global climate justice networks and inform policy decisions. So I'm, I'm not sure if you were able to call the slides at this point, can you see that? Because yes. I'd really love for you to see these maps. Yeah. You can? Yes. Yeah, okay, so this is um, the, the fifth slide. So this is, uh, um, <laughs> so, uh, it should be, you should be seeing two maps, um, uh, US maps. Uh, so the the climate um, actually so, so, sorry this is the, the one right before this. So the climate alliance mapping project it draws inspiration from the scholarship on counter mapping. So we know that maps are far from perfect, and historically they've been used as a tool by governments around the world for colonization and dispossession of indigenous lands. Nonetheless, there's a tremendous power to maps because they shape how we see, understand, and act in the world. And local communities and indigenous peoples have been using participatory mapping to reclaim land. So we're inspired by, by Berkeley geographer Bernard Leachman's perspective on maps, who wrote that if well designed, that map will have transcendental power because it can be easily translated by everyone everywhere. It transcends liter literacy, it is visually comprehensible, it can be a more powerful national symbol than a flag or an anthem. Its creation reinforces group cohesion where one cartographer is a technician, <coughs> while a community of cartographers is a force, and it provides strong credibility to its producers. He called this process countermapping, a strategy of using maps for social justice. So in essence, what the Climate Alliance Mapping Project really is, is um, about developing global counter maps. So the next slide, uh, please, this is the, the, sl the slide that should have two maps. So these two maps were requested by an indigenous environmental organization 
um, in the United States to understand the scale and magnitude of pipeline spills in the U.S. following Standing Rock. So the image on the left is a map of oil and gas pipelines across the U.S. And the map on the right illustrates pipeline spills between 2010 and 2017. We had data that went back as, as far as 19, the 1980s, but that data completely inundated the map. So even with, within the short span of seven years, we were shocked at the number and size of oil spills across the US. These maps were used to support climate justice efforts drawing on university research. Next slide, please. So um, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, I've been working closely with indigenous communities to develop a climate change mitigation project aligned with social justice. It emerges out of the growing scientific evidence that local and indigenous communities are best positioned to protect forests because they've done so for millennia, and that's that knowledge has been passed on through generations. So based on decades of research in this field, I've become deeply concerned about existing carbon markets and offset projects. They can fail to address the main drivers of deforestation and instead target and constrain the land use practices of local and indigenous communities. In an attempt to avoid many of the problems found with conventional carbon forestry projects, I've been investigating alternative models based on climate justice. In partnership with indigenous people of the Ecuadorian Amazon, we've been co-developing a project based on indigenous knowledge systems and worldviews that aims to support indigenous life plans. Next slide, please. Indigenous life plans are communally determined plans for well-being and local sustainable development that support common property arrangements. According to the indigenous peoples we collaborate with, the general objective of indigenous life plans is to guarantee the continuity of social, cultural, and political life organized by communities, maintaining well-being of the people and the perpetuity of their territories. The project articulates the community's history and current socioeconomic conditions and lays out a vision for the holistic development they'd like to realize in the future that integrates social, cultural, ecological, and economic, economic and spiritual values. And we see this project as a model for equitable climate change mitigation in tropical forests around the world. Next slide, please. So finally, I'd like to share the work of the UC Center for Climate Justice at the University of California, which is a, it's a system-wide initiative. And as the founding director of the UC Center for Climate Justice, I've been extremely proud and excited about the work we've accomplished over the last two years. We launched the center on Earth Day, April of 2021. Next slide, please. The mission of the center is to leverage and harness the power of the university to support, strengthen, and build an emergent climate justice ecosystem and social movement that solve the climate crisis through science, systems thinking, and social and ecological justice. And we do this through innovative, broader impact research, transformative education, and public engagement. There are six key pillars of the center's work, which is just transition, so focusing on transforming extractive fossil fuel-based economies to regenerative, equitable, and regenerative energy power systems. Um, social, racial, and environmental justice, which connects the dots between the climate crisis and a range of social, racial, and environmental justice issues. Indigenous climate action, which recognizes the important role of indigenous knowledge, governance, and ecosystem-based practices for addressing climate change. Community resilience and adaptation, because climate change is already underway and marginalized communities are already impacted and, and um, disproportionately impacted. Natural climate solutions is another pillar. So from an equity perspective, regenerative forest systems and agriculture are critical for addressing the climate crisis. And finally, the sixth is education and engagement because we're committed to transformative education that empowers millions of climate justice change makers. Next slide, please. At the center, in the last year and a half, we've been developing a climate justice course which is a hybrid or flipped course. That means that it's online as well as in person. And this is a course for undergraduate students specifically oriented around the key themes of climate justice. 
So the course has brought together lectures from a diverse pool of faculty members across the 10 UC campuses whose work tackles climate change from an equity and social justice perspective. And we plan to make this course more widely available with a goal of reaching tens of thousands of students each year. Next slide, please. And what's unique about the course is certainly the focus on equity, justice, and a systems approach. But also unique is that we want to take students through an experience of the collective hero's journey. So you've probably all, you're probably all familiar with the hero's journey and, and the framework at the basis of many myths and stories. It starts with a call to adventure, crossing of a threshold into the unknown, finding a mentor, facing challenges, entering into the abyss, which was a type of death, and then there's a process of rebirth and transformation and a return to one's community in a way utterly transformed. The hero's journey has been an important story for survival, but it no longer serves us in the 21st century, particularly in the context of a climate crisis. It fosters individualism, it's based on binary thinking, it's driven by conflict, and the focus is conquering the villain, often leaving the system that gave birth to the villain fundamentally unchanged. So we need a new story based on collective action, the collective hero's journey. It recognizes the importance of collective action where everyone can have an impact. It's driven by a cause with a goal of systemic change. It recognizes their strength and diversity, promotes the distribution of mentorship, and fosters empowerment. This is the basis of the course, and we want students to walk away understanding the urgency of the issue and feeling empowered to act collectively to address climate change from an equity and systems perspective. Uh, the, and the final slide. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for your attention, and I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. Indeed, we need a new story. We need uh, to rethink uh, the way we interact with the discourse on um, political ecology. I'm going to invite Panagiota to give us her contribution. Panagiota. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. So I'm, uh, I'm Panagiota Consila. I'm, I'm working here in Barcelona, in Spain, in the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. This is where I started as a postdoc some eight, nine years ago within the network of political ecology, the Enlightened Network, which was a EU-funded um, training network where many of us in what is now the current collective or constellation of undisciplined environments um, started from. I have also been involved as a mentor in the WIGO network, which was uh, led by the Institute for Social Science in the Erasmus University, which was a network of uh, feminist activists, feminist scholars um, within uh, political ecology. And now I am also uh, a core, let's say, member and, and researcher within the Barcelona Lab for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability here at, at ICTA. Uh, my research is focusing now on urban climate justice and focusing on immigrant collectives that have uh, traveled from countries of the global south, or majority world countries, and now live in cities within Europe. Um, and so my work is on political ecologies of health and the city from a feminist epistemological and methodological standpoint. But perhaps what I do is not really uh, very relevant here because I want to talk more about the work that we've done and that we're doing as a network and a collective under the name of Undisciplined Environments. So Undisciplined Environments is a, is a collective of scholars and activists who uh, share a common desire or who are oriented towards a common um, horizon of emancipatory sociological transformation, right? And the face of that collective so far has been a platform. Um, maybe I can share my screen here uh, for a bit just to show you the platform as I talk. Uh, I hope you can see it well. So, this platform is basically uh, where we um, have 
weekly or twice a week uh, posts in the form of short essays, but also other formats like video, audio, more uh, photographs, um, reflections from the field, um, early findings, and reviews of films, uh, where we publicize important events, and, and also we have a series that you can see here um, of different themes, the most recent one, for example, being on uh, political ecologists from Italy, um, others on political ecologists of the far right, and others. So this is a place online where we uh, publish what we edit, curate, um, and, and, and write ourselves uh, many times. Essays, reflections, other formats around political ecology and environmental humanities more broadly. So through maintaining this space over the last uh, nine years, which is completely open access and is based on the voluntary and um, unpaid work that we put into it, um, we aim to animate a space to share, to debate, to critically reflect on research, uh, but also on activist experiences, um, observations, methodologies, news and events, uh, art and music, and other themes and objects that we see as related to political ecology. By the way, the platform itself will transform. In the next few days, we're going to have a new, um, a new website, and so um, stay tuned. I hope I was able to show it to you today, but um, we didn't quite make it. Um, so we, as a collective, are all located in different places um, in the world. Most of us now are within uh, Europe. But we publish texts um, on issues and questions uh, from scholars and authors all around the world. So um, it's not Eurocentric uh, in any way, the content of it, but we as editors are mostly located in Europe. Also, language is a big restriction because um, we all work, uh, our common language, let's say, is English. We try to translate some pieces uh, in Spanish and Italian because we have that capacity every now and then, uh, but our content is mostly in English. So just to give you, uh, for those of you who don't know the, the, the platform, we get uh, about 1,500 views for our most read posts. Um, we get about 12,000 views monthly, and our uh, readership is mostly from the EU, but also North America, um, but also from India and China, followed by Latin America, Africa, and other places. So we managed to maintain a presence online for eight, nine years now, and what our latest, uh, let's say, endeavor was, or uh, has been, was to, to, to come together, to bring together um, the types of work that inspires us into a publication, uh, a book publication, where we make a, a collective effort to articulate some of our burning con concerns and desires through our role as editors, but also authors, and to bring together some writings on engaged political ecologies that uh, don't only seek to problematize and critique, but also to detect and maybe help sketch uh, common pathways, plural, but common pathways uh, of struggle and transformation. So this book is going to be called Insurgent Ecologies, and it will be collectively edited uh, by our collective, but it's an effort largely led by um, my colleague Diego Anderucci and Gustavo Garcia Lopez, and it is now undergoing review, it will be published hopefully within 2023 uh, by Fernwood Publications. And we wanted this book to be a reflection of what keeps us together, uh, right? Despite the fact that we're not working under the same uh, academic institution, a lot of us are, um, you know, are many times uh, outside of contracts, but we still keep engaging in this um, common effort. So our common point of departure is that, um, or let's say sort of a problem we detect is that despite long grappling with the question of how to be engaged uh, and move from theory to action, a lot of political ecology is still focusing mainly on critique. And it's also often characterized by inaccessible language um, and theorization that remains quite abstract. And so it, there's a lack of uh, kind of a more organic involvement in specific social struggles. So the key motivation for this book um, as it reflects our effort, also in the website, right, is to move beyond documenting the resistance against environmental destruction and violence, but also interrogating what are the possibilities of radical change that may emerge 
from these kinds of resistances. Um, so we're thinking um, also uh, with uh, Gramsci uh, about how environmental movements take part in what is referred to as counter-hegemony, to understand how a radical revolutionary politics can emerge from concrete place-based and often disconnected environmental struggles. So this is not only you know, a gesture to disrupt the coloniality of knowledge, because for too long, uh, as it has been said, it was said um, today, for too long we have learned about the subaltern struggles across co the colonized world via the accounts of northern uh, social scientists. But we also see it as an attempt to build, a, at least to some extent, a theory from below. So conceptualizing transformation from the point of view of its political protagonists, uh, like Paulo Freire would uh, say. The book is organized in five sections, and I'm not going to go into the details of it now, but I do want to mention that it brings case studies from uh, Palestine, Ecuador and Bolivia, Spain, Brazil, Turkey, uh, Chiapas, Colombia, Greece. So it's very, um, we really made an effort to include the voices and, and it's written together with activists. Most of this chapter is written together with activists, if not only by activists. So that's one thing I wanted to bring to the table uh, to, to share with you uh, this effort that we've, that we've been engaging um, in. And the second thing I want to speak to and invite us all to think about is um, who can afford to participate in such um, voluntary activities of um, building networks and also translating research into digestible pieces, right? Um, also offering editorial advice and including to students who don't have a lot of experience in writing who often um, send us their materials and, and really um, putting care and time and energy into, into publishing um, raw thinking or maybe new thinking, um, case studies that come very early from the field um, and so on, where we are functioning within a framework of neoliberal academia, which broadly classifies this work as basically a waste of time. Uh, that's the message that we're getting, um, because that kind of work does not produce recognition for our personal career advancement. So we find it, uh, we find it very nourishing, very enriching, satisfying, but we also find it very tiring very tedious, and uh, sometimes uh, we internalize this discourse of, uh, of, of doing it without any reward, which is not the case, but you know, we, we are within this contradiction, we face this contradiction, uh, but we stay with this struggle. So I think, um, you know, we, we all have talked about the ethical issues of publishing academic articles in big publishers who make millions uh, of dollars or euros out of the work of researchers and reviewers. Um, but still the problem remains, and it is tightly connected with academic precarity and the kind of criteria that is established to measure excellence uh, within, at least uh, from where we're talking through in, in, in European universities, that is the case. I think that many of you uh, also are facing the same kinds of problems. Um, so as a closing remark, I'd like to stress, you know, there are not many of us who can afford to do this work, this work of scholar activist communicators or interlocutors, uh, so to say. At a time when what we need is exactly that, is that, that the lessons that political ecology and environmental justice and climate justice research can provide travel far and wide beyond our own specific geographical networks, but also beyond strictly academic networks. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll close here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Panegiota. Let me call in Ember. We've got one more uh, speaker and then we close the session. We'll have, uh, of course, a question and answer session before we conclude. I have no slides. You have no slides, okay. I have no slides. All of my slides are upstairs um, with the Future Natures exhibit. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Amber Huff. Um, I'm a researcher at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, um, and I'm le lead of an initiative called Future Natures. Um, our initiative is interested in using research, arts, and storytelling to explore the evolving ecologies of crisis, commoning, and enclosure. Oh, sorry. Um, and our work is really built around the idea that better futures 
are not only possible, but they're already, exi they're already existent in the making. So why am I talking about commons right now? Um, commons are important. Um, we know from Panagiotis' talk about undisciplined environments, how important um, what we might call the work of co their work of commoning is to our network. Um, existing commons are everywhere, but they're often invisibilized by bigger institutions and the narratives that they tell. Commoning is found in agrarian settings and forests where people struggle for their land and their right to exist. It's found in our homes and in our cities, in digital spaces. Commoning happens in our workplaces, in our libraries, in our universities. It happens anywhere that people come together in their common interest to self-organize and to create or defend forms of value outside of the direct control of the state and the market. Commoning um, is often situated in ways of knowing and struggling that are contrary to neoliberal bureaucratic and fiscal logics, contrary to top-down authoritarian solutionism and universalized and linear notions of development and progress. As political ecologists, we recognize that worlds are being made and remade in places through people's struggles. The power of the existing commons comes from the ability to produce powerful counter narratives, but more than that, to show by existing and by persisting that other ways and better worlds are possible. Pollen is a commons. It was launched and has been sustained through voluntary labors of care as a generative space of networking and cross pollination. Pollen um, as a network was launched in 2015 uh, envisioned as an alternative type of uh, research organization or professional, or professional organization um, with no fees, no core funding, no underwriting from big academic for-profit publishers, no permanent officers, and as an open network and claimed space for sharing ideas and experiences um, and for working against the conventional disciplinary silos and bureaucratic strictures of neoliberal academia. As a commons, we should never forget that pollen is what we make it, pollen is what we do, and as an organization, it's inseparable from the people that are here today and many who are not here today. Pollen began as an idea, and that idea um, has lasted eight years now. I think that's pretty great. Um, for many of us, it's transformed our lives as political ecologists, as members of a community of practice. Um, and we've come together over time in a massive international network. This is, I think, the fourth international conference that's been held. Um, Pollen has weathered a pandemic, and I know I'm not alone in being really grateful to be back together with all of you lovely pollinators. Um, really happy to be, get, be back together again. Um, and as we come together outside of Europe for the first time, I think this is a really special meeting and a really special opportunity to be face to face. It's been way too long. So pollen is a commons, but I think that we should also be aware that anytime we try to name, define, or describe a thing, we run the risk of constructing new boundaries and abstractions and exclusions. Commons is just one word, one way of framing and telling a story about social action. Um, and this is a story that in many ways, uh, in many spaces and by many names, and sometimes by no name, exists and has really always existed when people have decided to work together to multiply the values that they wanna see in the world. So I wanna conclude briefly um, with a challenge to us all and a provocation in the spirit of Indaba. Um, to keep our eyes open to plurality, to existing possibilities, to find our affinities in our work, to make kin, and to practice the solidarities that we need to get along and to support each other. Because this is a weird, violent, and changing world. Thanks. Thank you, Ember, for keeping it short. 
I'll move on to uh, Simon to give us, um, you know, concluding remarks. Simon, if you can join us. Thank you very much. It's very late in Australia, so I shall be brief. Um, so who am I? Um, we normally in Australia recognise Indigenous elders as owners of the land on which we work, and I think that sentiment um, sums up my sort of 30 odd years of work in political ecology, where um, I may be older these days, but I'm still um, very much involved in some of the issues that you've been talking about there, and I wish I could have been there too. Um, with a great deal of recognition um, of, I suppose, overcoming the binaries of North and South. We've heard a great deal about that. Um, briefly, in my case, I'm working with Matthias Kovacs, who's there in the audience, on putting out work about um, divisions between black and white, between Europeans and Melanesians in um, um, New Caledonia and Kanaki in the Pacific Islands. We have a huge book coming very soon, um, where there's extraordinary varieties of conflict, some of which you've talked about, some are about nickel mining, some are about geopolitics, some are about racial difference and the persistence of settler colonialism. And I suppose my job is, in part in this research, is to try and overcome some of those differences and bring to the table, we both are really trying to bring to the table a sense of justice, um, if not equality. Those uh, types of injustices persist in other settler economies, as Australia is one of the most unequal countries in the Western world. Um, even though I talk to you from a small corner, very, very far south in the world, it nonetheless has that type of um, uh, political ecology element to everything that goes on here with persistent mining, uh, resource exploitation and so forth. Um, I think, uh, so that gives me a sort of sense of altruistic or agile activist um, perspectives and political ecology does that. Um, now, I'll just move on to one of the things you might um, want to hear about, a little bit more about, about publications and the journal of political ecology. Um, what some of you have said about the difficulties of putting out our material um, applies very much in the scholarly domain. And as we've heard, our disciplined environments does so in a very unique and vibrant way. Um, our journal tries to cross between North and South in different ways. So we publish classic, long form academic articles. And by the way, there are no word limits. And what is the longest paper? 27,000 words by Juan Martinez Allier and colleagues. Um, please don't send me too many of those. Um, and um, we've also um, recognized the, the, the really disgraceful slanting of academic work, the way in which it um, has benefited five major companies in the world. Um, I would love to refuse to deal with any of them, but I've kind of pegged my mast to the anti-Elsevier campaign. And um, I actually think in a normative sense that um, we need to think beyond them. And so JPE is, again, another community of scholars. It's a type of commons. We don't have fees for authors or for anybody to publish. But we recognized our own colonial roots. The people who have done the majority of the work, um, many of the referees and so on, have been um, have never reimbursed. And in this scholarly domain, what we've done is we've um, helped to set up, although I, we, the original editors don't run it, a section called Grassroots, which is primarily led by activist scholars with roots in the Global South or living in the Global South, 
and that section takes much shorter pieces those are curated by a team of four or five people and um i've made the decision to give them doi numbers and to feed them into the general journal that affects to some extent our rankings and things like that but it's the right thing to do um so a community-led approach to getting political ecology work out there i think requires things like undisciplined environments and our type of journal is what i've called many times social justice publishing and i've got in a lot of trouble for pursuing that line um, perhaps more deeply than many others in a rather uncompromising way um, but uh, the commitment is by scholars who have the time the salary and the energy to put in towards such projects and so i encourage you to think about that and there's many contemporary debates in geography and other disciplines about how exactly we do this in a very changing um, in a much changing landscape um, papers from south africa and others we have published are um, fantastic in the explorations they've done of the key contemporary issues there particularly around conservation and mining and we hope for more um, in terms of what we've learn today as well there's really a, a long list i've been noting um, we've noted um, inconsistencies of renewable energy transitions which is affecting people not only in europe but um, the, the exploitation of mineral resources and other resources in distant lands distant from the major sources of uh, where the consumers are um, there's a lot of work, I think, that political ecology has been doing on sort of mega environmental movements analysis, which is really progressive and also trans, uh, transcends north and south. And um, I think uh, to sum up, um, political ecology exists in an odd liminal space. It's kind of, um, it, it exists as within a contemporary university structure that is often opposed to some of the fundamental tenets of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to say um, but then again it's 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 beginning to obtain i suppose a sort of academic cachet it's actually now there are chairs in political ecology i held one once myself uh, there's only five or six of them but they're coming um, we have um, we challenged a lot of the labor and work practices within our own universities we've definitely uh, exposed conflicts and issues worldwide and continue to do so um, but at the same time um, the the collective efforts are hard to realize and they re they're still part of really an ongoing struggle uh, we have in our journal, I think um, Jens would know as well as I do, something like 105 articles in progress. They're all worthy of our time and effort. We don't have all of that time sometimes to give. Um, and the topics are so wide ranging. So we have the plural, pluriversal debates mentioned today. Uh, and whether pluriversal entities and movements can actually unify sufficiently in the classic Marxist sense to initiate change. That's a big source of debate. We've got the classic debates about extractivism, largely from Latin America, um, published in uh, several languages that we offer in the journal. Um, but are we and even the the as who was it mentioned here education um uh tracy uh, mentioned education and pedagogy as an issue um there's a good deal of work coming through in journals like ecology economy and society based out of india which are addressing those head-on as well so i think um uh, aside from the journal itself what we've learned today is some really interesting stuff about uh, different angles for north and south. What I've been doing is taking very detailed notes and I'll certainly offer the speakers the 
um, the forum of the journal if you would like to use it for something in future. Uh, we've seen so many examples of initiatives that cross north and south. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Simon. I'll send my article through. So we'll go to the next session. Uh, we just have 10 minutes of uh, question and answer. And also, those that want to comment, this is your opportunity. Can you, can you hear me? OK, great. Um, thank you. Um, that was a really fabulous panel with a lot of uh, great perspectives um, on the topic of, of decolonization, et cetera. Um, I'm Catherine Corson, by the way, uh, from Mount Holyoke College in the United States. Um, I'm curious to ask a quick question, which is about the relationship between some of the words that we heard today, uh, decolonization, commoning, justice, uh, the pluriverse, solidarity, and discomfort. And um, what role discomfort plays in, in working across difference um, to try to achieve some of the things that the speakers were talking about today? Uh, I have a question to Felipe. Uh, so the, in the recent pink tide across the Latin America, I mean, we, uh, uh, lots of countries have select elected the communist governments, uh, but it's a kind of, a, there is a contradiction of what to do with the extraction of some minerals, which are like uh, in integral for energy transition and et cetera, for in Chile or in Argentina or in Brazil as well. Uh, so how do you think uh, the political ecology, uh, the group that you are heading, I mean, will deal, deal with this uh, change in governance system, but kind of, uh, older extra extractivist system. Hi, I'm uh, Anvesha. I had uh, two quick questions, uh, one for uh, Mano. Mano's still here, right? Oh, no, okay, then someone, uh, one of you can <laughs> answer that. So it, it was for Mano and also, and one for Felipe. So Felipe, you mentioned that you are a white Brazilian uh, from southern Brazil, and then you moved to a university which is uh, primarily indigenous, indigenous territory. So how did you kind of reconcile your positionality there? Was it a steep learning curve? How did you get yourself accepted or not within the community and working in this space of uh, decolonizing? And the second question is a more open one, and I was gonna ask Mano, something that we don't talk about enough is of emotional labor of many um, of us brown, black people while engaging in this process of uh, decolonizing. It's almost like a decolonizing fatigue, um, you know, at some point. So how can we talk about this kind of emotional labor um, for many of us while doing that? Thanks. Um, I'd like to respond to Catherine's question um, about, you know, where is, what is discomfort? in all this. Um, I think whether we're talking about um, decolonizing and certain approaches to commenting for sure, as well as building solidarities, I think, I think we're definitely in the same universe um, and you know, probably ballpark when we're, when we're up here. Um, where, but I, I think one of the most kind of toxic things that can emerge like within academic departments or workplaces is this idea that any conversation that we have has to be one in which everybody remains comfortable. Um, it, it's this tendency to depoliticize and and suppress conflict rather than letting it air and, and making sure that everybody feels comfortable with a bit of discomfort now and then when it needs to be broached, when things are really important. Um, yeah, so I think that you know, if, if we're going to foster more collegial atmospheres, we need to be more comfortable with discomfort, um, particularly those of us with a lot of privilege who haven't had a lot of opportunity to, to be discomforted um, or confronted by colleagues that we might um, interact with in inappropriate ways without even thinking about it um, or contribute to broader systemic problems that we would like to not contribute to um, or to fight against? Well, first, uh, 
thing I would like to express my solidarity with the people in Jujuy, you know, in North Argentina, as I said, like that are fighting against lithium mining there. Uh, Latin American researchers, they have a, a fantastic production about mining, very diverse, and it, what it's, I, I'm feeling very interesting to be part of that group is that we can read uh, a lot of uh, different uh, experience of my resistance against mining. Uh, Brazil is heavily affected by mining, like Vale, but there is a strong agribusiness sector, which is the plantation system that is still remaining. Uh, so, we, uh, and I work with, let's say, both forms of vi territorial violence, is, uh, because I work in, in Pará, in the state of my Amazon. But there is a, a, a great tradition of uh, scholar writings from Argentina. I would mention Horacio Machado, Araoz, uh, Stefan uh, Maristela Svampa, and, and etc. The, the concept of extractivism in Ecuador and other. And uh, denouncing extraction and mining, it's a way to, let's say, to push the left government for the left. You know, like we have Lula now in Brazil, there's a big discussion on it. And it's an it's a interesting experience to learn with, you know, what, what's circulating in other countries. Uh, Brazil, during, now in Lula government, the minister for mining, is, he, he, he gave that to the right wing. Instead of in Colombia, the minister for mining, there for mining and energy, is a woman that she's anti-extractivist and pro-degrowth. We are just publishing an interview with her in the next uh, Journal of Ecologia Política that was conducted by Sandra, one of the researchers. So, personally, to me, it has been a wonderful experience because we speak Portuguese in Brazil and the rest of Latin South America speaks Spanish. And we do read a lot of uh, Spanish contributions in Brazil. So I'm learning a lot with all this experience. And, and we understand that it's the learning the resistance to mining, extractivism, and, and the experience of indigenous and black populations in, in Latin America uh, show us that the task for the left is much more deep than what is being discussed today by the, the left-wing parties that comes from unions, you know, like Workers' Party in, in Brazil, and we're talking about the Chile situation, that they had this wonderful constitution led by an astonishing Mapuche leader, uh, Elisa Loncon, and then they were defeated by the, by the right wing, and now it's tension, and, and it's, a non, it's a long struggle, and, the, uh, and the, the theoretical experience from Latin America, it's, it's really... Fascinating, and I am fascinated to read that. I would recommend it to read more. And uh, concerning my move to, to, to Bahia, uh, I was, that, that's a national system of universities, so it's a very competitive concourse to, to, to move to any of the new universities, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I had the chance to be approved there. Uh, and I was attracted by the change that happened in, that, in those universities in the north of Brazil in the past 10 years, during the second term of the first year, Lula government, in 2000, around 2008, 2010, those universities, they changed a lot in Brazil. They opened to interdisciplinarity. So I was accepted there. I w I'm not accepting the south where I come from. They don't want me, you know, because I come from activist, journalism, lawyer, and by yeah, I was accepted. And, uh, and I'm fascinated with the struggles there. But then I realize how to position ourselves in, in those struggles. There are lots of tensions. And among whiteness as well, you know. So being, uh, let's say, white from outside of the local elite creates some conflicts with the all local elites. Personally, I suffered a lot from that. I had to change university. And, uh, but, but then I, I feel like I, I, I feel like a lab, and it's fascinating. And, uh, but this comes from the experience also that I have to have an external view. You know? So I'm working now with a project with a friend from Sussex when I went there last, 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 last April, and I met Louise Wise that uh, is uh, working with genocide. So I, I, I decided let's work together in, in, in Brazil and I, we can get those funds and build 
a work in Brazil about genocide and ecocide against indigenous people, but how to implement that. And a uh, few weeks ago, I found out that we could do that work together with indigenous students from those nations that suffer genocide. So, I mean, it's, I'm reflecting about that. Two years ago, I wouldn't do it, but now I saw that that, that was an opportunity to, to build a new work together, to exchange ideas, to give visibility to, to, to that situation. And this international partnership is very relevant uh, to give visibility, recognition for the Tusha and the Pankararu nations, and also uh, to myself, let's say, in terms of internal struggles inside the university, because it's, it's a very conservative university in somehow as well. So uh, we need to produce and, uh, and, and have let's say, broader alliances, so then we can uh, build local alliances as well uh, in terms of advancing with uh, emancipatory uh, education. But most of the more important thing here is to defend a public university system absolutely free, inclusive, you know, so that's, that's I, I, I'm for that. I'm not discussing academicism here, you know. I'm discussing defending university, a public university, with affirmative action and an anti-colonial university and build a new university there. Uh, I'm very motivated uh, by that. And uh, Bahia is really beautiful, and I hope we can make one poll in there. Okay. I, I would like to bring um, those speakers on the virtual space. There was a comment on the emotional labor of decolonization. If you can, maybe Tracy, Pan Panagiota, and Simon, if you can give us comments on that. The emotional labor of decolonization within the field of political ecology. I mean, I can, I can speak a bit about that. Um, I also, Catherine's uh, um, question about the, the discomfort. I mean, public political ecology engaged, you know, political ecology, I think the work of um, the like, undisciplined environments, I mean, that, that's, it's very, it's very difficult in, within the academic spaces. I mean, I think it's, it's, there's starting to be more attention to the importance of engagement and engaging with and community engagement. So I think there's there's more space for it, but nonetheless, um, it's certainly um, you know it's it's still often unrecognized. It's it's you know under undervalued. It's really work that's very difficult to do um, pre tenure. I mean, I think much of the work that I've done, I, I did definitely start doing some of this work of public political ecology even before, um, before, before tenure, just because it's what motivated me. It's the reason that I'm, I'm in academia to begin with. I started in activism and looked to, to, to academia for, how, for, for um, a, a, a better understanding of the broader political ec ec economy. And finding political ecology was just, it, it was a game changer for me. And so now I'm in a position where I can actually, um, you know, I can actually do some of this work. I, you know, the, the Center for Climate Justice is definitely draws on, on my knowledge of political ecology. The work that I do with indigenous peoples in the Amazon is, I, I don't always talk about it, but it's definitely um, inspired by that work. But nonetheless, it's extremely, challenging to do it within academic spaces. The, the, um, the time frame of, of work within, this, within with academia, what's recognized in you know, being able to get information out in, in, a, in a particular way, um, it takes a toll. And it's honestly, it's, there's a lot of discomfort because it's, it can be exhausting. And um, it, it, it's also, um, yeah, it, it can be, it can be, it can be exhausting as the truth. So, um, I, but I think spaces like, the, like these, these types of conversations, I think the, like I've been following the work of Entitled for a very long time. I'm really supportive of, of, you know, and I've published in the Journal of Political Ecology. So I think, um, we're in the right, we're in, in right environment to continue to, to move this work forward. 
Thank you, Tracy. If I can have a short comment on the discomfort aspect as well. Um, I want to maybe uh, reflect on another kind of discomfort that we, um, I think, need to face and, and, and confront and stay with, um, not, not from the industrial environment's uh, point of view, but generally in, the, in political ecology as a, as a broader network. Um, and it is the discomfort of bearing witness to uh, hypocrisy when um, people theorize and write about and research on justice and commoning and um, all these um, you know, ideal uh, ideas, and then their practice within the university and, and uh, within the field, so to speak, is completely contradictory. And I'm talking here about, you know, uh, from labor abuses to not recognizing the work of, uh, of, of people that are uh, below uh, in terms of academic hierarchy and not giving a space for, um, for students to present their work, appropriating work, appropriating concepts, appropriating um, um, theories, presenting them as your own, um, and uh, of course, you know, let's, let's talk about also sexual abuse of, uh, that takes place within the university, within the field, uh, with collaborators and, and, and so on. And I think that uh, marginalized, uh, feminized, and, and, and racialized people are the ones who suffer most of those uh, from academics. And I think we have to be attuned to this. We have to speak out and uh, not ignore it. And um, I think, yeah, I felt that this was a big discomfort that I have been facing and a lot of us have been facing and it's hard to talk about it because it's always about the big concepts, the important concepts that are being produced, but uh, how they come to be produced is also a matter of power and privilege. So I want to bring that up. Simon, do you want to offer any comments? Uh, just briefly. Um, so, people like me, the old white bloke, we feel discomfort the whole time. Uh, what I've done practically uh, is to develop a whole second strand of re personal research, which is around uh, bicycles for disadvantaged groups, and we build them and we give them out locally, and um, many of our recipients are refugees. It's fantastic to do that, but that's just a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean to reduce some degree of discomfort, but the actual time I spend on that is huge. So that plus the journal doesn't leave much time for research. I will no longer do solo research in Africa. I don't think it's appropriate. I think people back in Burkina Faso can do it themselves um, and uh, should do. Um, and again, I've taken some flack for that type of position um, and I've completely almost changed my career path as a result of those types of decisions. Um, but I encourage people to really think this through, and I think the um, partnerships that we've heard today are really vital because they cross North and South. Um, those of us who are in these kind of big universities in the global North, we don't have an easy time, but we certainly don't have as hard a time as many of you are used to in your academic lives and even seeking jobs. And I think that the network that I've built up is mainly people who have benefited from good grace and humility by a lot of the senior people in the field. Thank you so much. Thank you to the speakers. I think we've just uh, went over time.